Hello, my name is Andre Ward and I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. Welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the criminal legal system from various perspectives, including people most impacted by the criminal legal system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and we highlight the issues that affect and impact everyone. We ask you, the viewers, to spread the word about both sides of the bars and share your comments with us on Twitter, at the Fortune Society, S-O-C. Today's show is entitled 2022 Year in Review, and this is part two of our 2022 Year in Review segment around criminal justice reform and the road ahead. 2022 has been a year of significant change within the criminal justice reform movement, in the first two episodes, a panel of experts or rather looked back at 2022 and discussed where we are now and where the criminal legal world is heading in 2022. And so the topics that we covered in the part one of this segment is bail reform, fear mongering in the media, Rikers Island, mental health, and jails and prisons in the United States. And what do the midterm election results mean for criminal legal reform, both nationally and locally? And in part one of this segment, we had guest Scott Hetchinger, who is a civil rights attorney and longtime public defender and the founder and executive director of Zealous, which is a national advocacy and education initiative, working to topple the historic imbalance of power over criminal justice media and policy. And also Alaya May Lauren, who is the director of media advocacy at Zealous and is also an attorney and a political commentator and abolitionist thinker. And she is a prominent voice in the movement to decarcerate and close Rikers, which is an infamous pretrial detention center in New York City, where 19 people have died in the past year. She's been published in Teen Vogue, The Grio, News One, and appeared on many media outlets like The Hill, MSNBC, CBS, NBC, iHeartRadio, NPR, Yahoo, and on and on. And she releases essays monthly on Alluranati where she critically analyzes different issues of our time. Scott and Aliyah May, thank you so much for joining us again for part two of our conversation of 2022 Year in Review, Criminal Justice Reform and the Road Ahead. And so when we spoke last, right, you all touched on some really important issues, among them, obviously, bail reform, fear mongering, and what does that mean in the media, the recent death, the 19th death on Rikers Island and the conditions there, and we were talking about some of the mental health conditions in jails and prisons. I want to turn a little bit to now, um, there's been some important legislation that has been amplified over the last two or three years or so, and many people have gotten behind it to support, but it's yet to get to the finish line, so there's a legislative win. And I'm talking about clean slate legislation. And Scott, uh, Aliyah may share your thoughts a little bit about this legislation. In 2022, we thought we were fairly close to having this legislation passed. As it happened, it didn't. So let's talk to our viewers about what is clean slate legislation. Scott, <laughs> start us off. We got it. Look, there are something like 70 million people right now in the United States walking around with, um, with criminal records. And uh, that sounds like a lot of people. And we've heard of criminal records before. What we don't think about is what a criminal record actually means. I'm fortunate enough never to have been arrested. Um, uh, I am white. I lived in not a policed neighborhood. Um, if I lived in a neighborhood like the folks, thousands of folks I've represented, um, arrest is all but impossible to avoid. Um, and actually, I take out the all but impossible. Um, and when you get a criminal record, even just in a record of arrest, what winds up happening is uh, people call them collateral consequences. I call it perpetual punishment. Um, you are marginalized. Uh, a criminal record, even for the lowest level offenses or even arrest record, if you're an immigrant, can render you deportable. Um, it can get you suspended or fired from a job. It can keep you out of housing, affordable housing. It can kick your family out of affordable housing if you happen to be living with them. It can keep you from education, benefits, jobs, and more. And so when I, when I would meet folks um, who were charged with, you know, whatever you want to be charged with, oftentimes the file that I would be handed as a public defender would be literally heavy, like it would have weight. And it would always tell this familiar story of, of 
you know, a mistake um, really early on in life, um, a criminal record followed by marginalization, followed by a steady churn of arrests for crimes of poverty after crimes of poverty, like jumping the turnstile, low level drug possession, petty larceny, et cetera. Because in the society where we say, yeah, everyone can be, you know, be successful, you get out, you have a criminal record on, we should be invested in people re-entering society. And in fact, we do the exact opposite. We push people farther away. This leads to what the heck clean slate is. It kind of sounds like what it sounds like. It are their efforts to give, I think, far too limited number of people, but like, but a, a, a class of people, depending on the legislation, who have criminal records, the ability to have a clean slate, actually be able to forget re-enter society, be able to have even the slightest chance of succeeding, of getting a job, of getting benefits, of education, all the stuff I just mentioned. Um, I can talk more about, about why I think uh, those, those, those efforts haven't yet succeeded in the way that they, that they need to. Um, a lot of it has to do, obviously, with fear mongering. Um, but, but that ties into kind of a broader issue I'm excited to talk about, which is what I would deem democratic. Um, uh, I was going to say lack of courage. What's, what's a better yeah. word for it? <laughs> democratic. Yeah. Weakness. And a liar, man. Uh, yes. weakness. What's, the, what's the word? <laughs> sure, a liar, man. Like your thoughts, right? I, I hear, I can see, like, hear, like, the thoughts, like, percolating, right? And so, yeah, like, I have no nice thoughts, word. Right? And some responses <laughs> to those things. And then, I want to turn to what's also really important in, in the year 2022 is, is the election outcomes. And, like, yeah. what does that mean for the future uh, work of criminal legal system reform locally and nationally? So, if you want to respond a little bit to Scott's uh, comments around Clean Slate, fine. If not, we certainly want to hear your thoughts around the election outcomes and what does that mean for the future of criminal legal system reform uh, nationally and locally? I think... Okay, I think I think Scott said every everything beautifully. Um, so I will I will not I will not build on that. I think that was I think that was beautifully done. The reality is of criminal criminal records are not just ways in which we punish individual people, but it's the way that we keep entire communities and families stuck in generations and generations and cycles of poverty and criminalization. So uh, absolutely, but I do think the failure to see that is also a reflection of a larger a larger failure that we keep seeing, and it's um, they're scared. Um, it's, whether it be Fair or weakness, I don't know which or both, but what I've noticed is an unwillingness to accept that pushback is inevitable. Something I've realized in terms of advocating around Rikers, advocating, you know, for anything, what you get from these, you know, well-intentioned politicians is they want you to give them something that they could say or something that they could, they could run on that will not receive any pushback. And there is no such a position. I think a lot of Democrats who are... I don't want to even give them the credit for well-meaning, but they're Democrats who are operating in an 80s, 90s, kind of early aughts political mentality where there's, where political, you know, where anything that could be potentially deemed soft on crime is political suicide, right? Um, but they're not accounting for the fact of a massive change in demographics, uh, uh, you know, the increasing numbers of folks under 30 that are that are voting in droves and are like actually craving um, policies kind of across the board that are more reasonable and progressive. They're not accounting for the fact that because of the advent of iPhones and footage, that more and more people are less and less willing to just take police at their word. Um, and, and so what, what we see is, is Democrats, like Ole was saying, listening to public opinion polls, like looking at public opinion, opinion polls and seeing you know, what, they're, they, what they think about clean slate and they're not comfortable with it or bail reform and that makes them scared. And without realizing that the reason why they think that way is because no one's taken the time to actually educate constituents about the truth, about the current situation, about the truth, about this extraordinarily powerful and, and proven law like bail reform. And so um, I think actually what I take away from um, the tw uh, one of the big things I take away from the 2022 20, midterms actually is, is, is positive news. GOP spent hundreds of millions of dollars active lies and fear mongering. And still, and still, um, we saw democratic wins across the country. And the places where you look that, that had bail reform and where Democrats actually did at least a version of standing behind the law and educating their, their, their constituents, they won. We saw that in 
Harris County, Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. where Lena Hidalgo, the chief judge, was a, met, was a huge uh, supporter of bail reform. And, and um, Adrian Garcia, county commissioner, stood out, stood from it and, def and beat back tons of money. And in New York, where there's this ridiculous emerging narrative that bail reform sunk congressional Democratic hopes, I took the opposite. The, the National Democrats lost because they failed to distinguish themselves and, in fact, like joined the fear mongering over bail reform, while folks like Carl Hasty, the Speaker of the, uh, the Assembly, defended it and won a supermajority. Yeah. Governor Kathy Hochul, for all the, 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 the um, things that I disagreed with earlier on in the year, she stood behind the truth on bail reform, and she is the first female elected governor. And so you don't even have to look. You know, and then there's a the state senator that won an incumbent GOP seat. So you don't even need to look to other jurisdictions. In New York, the folks who actually stood for truth won. Um, and so what? Right. I, what I, the takeaway I have is like, geez, like if we were able, despite all of the fear mongers, despite this moment with this the claims of of crime spiking and the the amount of power that we were still able to not only like win. Um, but the folks who actually stood behind it won. Like, what might it look like if Democrats in more numbers just stood behind truth? I think it's yeah. totally imperative, but they'd win. <laughs> you know, I think I think there's something. When I was in when I was in law school, my mentor Messiah Lord, how he would train us, and he would say you would always be able to be able to tell who was the prosecutor trained uh, mock trial team versus who was the defense trained team because the defense team knows they have to put on. Like, you know, you have to be creative. You have to defend somebody. It doesn't matter if things are stacked against you or not. You have to do it. Whereas the prosecutor is going to choose the strongest, what they think is most likely to win. Where they have the evidence, they stick to the confines of, of, of the sheet because it's um stacked. It's already stacked in their favor. And I think that's something that I think a lot of our, the, these Democratic politicians and advocates don't have the benefit of. I think in being a public defender, you recognize you're always in you're always in the minority. I always expect to be standing off on the ledge in my own. I always expect a pushback, but a conversation. I realize when I have when I'm beside behind the scenes trying to speak to these politicians, trying to tell them, you know, advocate for this or say something, you know, about this. They're always so concerned with, like, like what can I say? Well, every trying to to address every minutia, every kind of every kind of pushback, but in actuality. You can, you just have to recognize these conversations are going to be had regardless. Like if you're going to have any kind of position, you're going to have to defend it because there's going to have to be violent attack. And I think if you look at even like, I've been very involved in speaking out for bail reform in New York City and speaking out for it in Chicago and getting in on early, I've never seen a more concerted effort or campaign against some bail reform like what I saw the minute before Chicago, the Chicago bail reform has yet. It doesn't take effect till January. It's still not an effect, but the way the purge law campaign hit the streets and yet people were, when I, when I put out a video and when I put out the information to people to debunk that, people, people, they love that. They galvanize around that. They know that something doesn't seem quite right to them, but they don't have the wherewithal, the information, the knowledge or the time to, to know all the ways in which they're being propaganda is being fed to them um, and they will receive it. And you saw, despite the fact, the intensity of this campaign, once we actually put out the information, you saw people galvanizing, no, 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 the pretrial fairness act is, is actually fair. And you see, it's going to take effect. So I think we need to have less of the, the fair. I think we approach advocacy with too much fair from a lot of our politicians in New York City. Yeah, speaking of fear, again, one of, you know, each of you are a part of Zealous and continue to do the important work of countering narratives, right? Yes. I want your, just your thoughts again about why is it so critically important that these narratives are countered? What can people do, right, yep. to join in that kind of effort to counter narratives, right? How do we organize in a way that we can debunk some of the myths and dispel some of those false notions and beliefs? You want me, you want me to go, Scott? Yeah. Um, you, do you want, you, you, yeah, whatever, you tell me. I Okay, I the the reason why I think it's important is so often when you when you draw people's attention to any any level of injustice or any tragedy, they either ask you what can I do or they immediately feel defeated that there is nothing they could do because they feel like the powers that be don't care. And they're right. They're right in the sense that the powers that be don't care. Like awareness is not for them. The people that are are perpetuating and maintaining these institutions and all this injustice in our country know what's happening. The people behind the scenes, the people in court, the judges, the prosecutors, the legislators know exactly what's happening at Rikers. But what they care about is 
public perception. People do what they believe they need to do or have to do in order to maintain power. And it just so happens, like Scott talk, touched upon earlier, they have relied on this very 80s idea of tough on crime, tough on tough, tough on crime. And they've been able to foster a media and a political world and everything that's really aligned and pushing that agenda and that narrative that, hey, crime, safety, these things we care about. And if we care about that, that is synonymous with more policing, more prosecutors, more of these things. But there is a world in which that changes when people are exposed to more information is the reason why we live in a world now where the same, the kind of tough on crime rhetoric you used to spew to win, you spew now and you're in trouble, you get ratioed and it's different because people are exposed to different things. So to me, it's the reason why it's so important for us to debunk these things is because when we tell the public, hey, actually, it's not how they've led you to believe. It's not what they're making you think about it. Those powers that be might not care when I tell them, when I tell them directly when we're saying it, but when they realize the public won't support that, that's when they switch what they support. And that's my why. Scott, you take it away. <laughs> we, got, we, got the, we got the why down. I mean, that, that's for sure. I mean, it doesn't matter what the issue is. Um, you know, the, we're, we're in a battle over people's basic intuitions of crime and punishment and what it's going to take to achieve health and safety. Um, and, uh, and, and what is it going to take? You know, some of the, I'll just, you know, describe some of the efforts that, that you know, that we're working on at Zealous around the country. What we've seen is, first of all, just engaging and calling in journalists similar to what we were talking about, bad faith actors, good faith actors. There's just like a inertia, like a status quo of like crime journalism that's like based upon sourcing basically exclusive from police and prosecutors instead of the folks that are closest to the issue. There's a type of language that journalists use to describe the people most impacted by the system. Inmates, felon, prisoner, these words that like are meant either intentionally, but at least have the effect of, of making it easier to be to support cruelty. Um, they take police data at, at its word and kind of fail to, to do more to nuance journalism. So we're working um, uh, on calling in journalists and actually, yes, critiquing, but providing journalists with tools to do the work better. We're also working to connect journalists, um, national and local, with public defenders, with organizers, with people in, who are directly impacted inside and out of jails and prisons so that um, it's not just to both sides, so that hopefully it becomes as easy uh, for journalists to have relationship with folks that are actually caring about health and safety than police and prosecutors who are spending millions of dollars on PR. Um, we are working with public defenders. You know, I, I one of the things I realized really early on was that limitations of my ability as a public defender inside of court to do anything approaching individual, let alone systemic injustice. And um, there's, again, similar to journalists among public defenders, these fighters, these storytellers, these strategic folks who like see the things that how things are operating to undermine health and safety and also like work with folks that are directly impacted. Um, they're, they're, they don't step out and talk to press, no comment. Um, they don't engage, they don't storytell outside of court. So working with journalists to train them on ethical and effective um, outside of court advocacy um, is something that I think is really important and something that our, a lot of the advocacy on our end comes to working with chief defenders on, on thinking more critically about this. And last but not least, you know, I'd say um, collaboration um, among the world of advocates. It's not just that the other side tells extraordinarily like powerful lies, stories that drive fear, right? Like it's, it, they, they have these stories. It's also that they're extraordinarily well aligned nationally. Um, and we as a movement, and I'm using this word very broadly, but all these different kind of, we operate in silos. Public defenders don't trust community, community doesn't trust public defenders, and, and artists don't feel included, and folks on the inside are literally separated by jail bars. But like, we need to get aligned. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is supporting local coalitions around the country to essentially like hate each other a little bit less, like find those areas of commonality and, and tell more compelling stories to fight back. For people out there um, who are not journalists, who aren't defenders, who aren't um, in the fight, first of all, get involved um, and become public defenders. We need more, more of them. But as consumers of news, be more skeptical. All right. Um, that's the, be more skeptical consumers of news and popular culture. Um, don't take just don't just take the word for it. You know better. You've seen the videos. Police lie all the time. Why are you going to take you know, why are you going to take their word for it when they talk about policy that is going to actually threaten their budgets, their line items, their control? So talk to more public defenders instead of reading the news. <laughs> sure. And thank you for that, Scott. A lot of made just some closing thoughts, right, that you have, right, in, in light of what's happening happened this year, um, what are your thoughts about the future, right? And, and like, what does that look like for you? 
I think people have a tendency to assume that you're feeling dissuaded with the movement. And I think it's because they often tend to look at the work um, starting from like 2020 to now. They'll say, oh, you know, we have this this massive um, support and this swell of support and the movement appeared to be taking steam. And then what happened? But in actuality, everything that we're fighting for now, all the injustices that we see, they've they've always they've, they've persisted. We're dealing with the same problems that were being dealt with in yesteryear. So the fact that we're even able to have these conversations, move this to the main stage, the fact that we've made it even and so abolition, progressive reform, bail reform, all these different things. There even can be a swell of support around. There can be national conversations. Is us moving forward? And so I look at it as we've had a we've had a lot of wins. We've had a we've had a lot of wins. Even just the even bail reform, even despite whatever rollbacks and the constant level of attacking and you know whatever setbacks we've even seen in Rikers, I still think that we're full steam ahead on actually gaining the traction and the awareness that we need in order to push legislators to do what needs to be done and to move towards a more progressive world. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know if each of you are familiar, you know, there's Fair Chance for Housing Act, this legislation that's happening on the city level that would end housing discrimination against people with conviction histories. I don't know if each of you are familiar with that. Either of you are familiar with that? Yes, I mean, it is. And, and like, what are your thoughts on that, right? I know it speaks to also this notion with clean slate, right? I mean, there are 750,000 people in New York City with conviction histories, right? 11% of whom may be adults and 80% of whom are Black and Latinx folk. And so we know that not act, allowing people to have access to housing, um, particularly as a specific group, has a disparate impact. But what are, what are your thoughts on that, Aliyah May? <laughs> Something I want to say about New York City is this is the most expensive city to live in the world. Like, that's the actual facts. That's not hyperbole. This is the most expensive city to live in the world. And for whatever reason, despite the fact that we talk all day about how expensive New York City is, and then we talk all day about the massive homelessness, and we never have those as a conversation to be had together. As someone who moved there, was not from here, so I had no guarantor in the tri-state area, I know personally the hardship on trying to to find an apartment is not just paying for it forget even how astronomical it is but the amount of hurdles that you have to jump through to get an apartment in the city even what is my current apartment the fact that I even y'all can see sunlight out there I used to live in a basement and I only have this apartment to affordable housing and this is a $2,200 apartment that's not your average person does not make that kind of money. They do not receive a livable wage. They cannot afford it. So if you add on top of that, on top of the poverty, the astronomical cuffs, all the red tape that we make it, and then a criminal record and everything that is just a reality of being a black and brown New Yorker, you you experience and live with NYPD and how they affect your 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 ability to get housing. It's, it's a huge problem. So this is an amazing thing. We absolutely need that act because we need to actually start, like I said, we, all day we talk about addressing the root causes of these issues instead of trying to use the criminal system to disappear homeless people, to disappear these people while the problems persist. Let's actually get these laws and initiatives passed so that regular New Yorkers who are everybody else, they are not this special brand of people more susceptible to homelessness or poverty than anybody else. They are regular New Yorkers struggling, don't find themselves in a the position. And so we don't all have to deal with what is homelessness. Sure. Scott, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, th I think about it in terms of, um, uh, you know, kind of from a narrative standpoint, we're so, you know, we were, I already was talking about kind of the sensational stories on the other side. And we tend to, as advocates, really talk about the sensational successes on the other side. So someone who um, didn't, uh, you know, was, was freed from a criminal record or was able to get housing and they went on to you know, get a high paying job or go to Yale Law School and become like an award winning, you know, whatever you, you want to call it. Um, what reform, capital R reform or what change or progressive change looks like is boring, normal, everyday life. And so I think when I think about um, obvious uh, uh, changes, like the one in the city level, but bail reform too, and all the stuff that we're talking about, I think about the enormous numbers of people that are going to be, be that are going to be benefiting and think about how can we get people kind of uh, uh, excited about or like used to these these everyday stories of, of freedom like because you know bail reform it looks like it looks like tying your own shoes instead of the government issue patakis it looks like walking down the street and smelling your smelling the air it looks like everyday life like housing affordable housing means like waking up in a bed with a house it means sunlight these things that like a lot of us take for granted, but make a huge, huge difference. So that's that's what I think about. Like, how can we in our work um, make it so that people are kind of not as inured to the yes, everyday injustices of 
just you know just a criminal record or an arrest and yeah but they were they were just released um and on the other side the everyday like normal i wouldn't call them successes but just like normalcy stories of the normalcy of freedom the normalcy of housing the normalcy of of healthcare etc absolutely well scott hessinger alaya may lauren right thank you both so much for joining us here today at both sides of the bars and thanks for sharing your observations and sharing um a recap of the year 2022 in the criminal legal system. I um, want to thank the viewers for joining us all here for this thought-provoking discussion. And in the meantime, on behalf of the Fortune Society, we want to thank all of you for tuning in to both sides of the bars. And if you're interested in finding out more about the Fortune Society, please check us out on the web at fortunesociety.org. That's fortunesociety.org. Or you can go on Facebook and type in the Fortune Society. This is Andre Ward, and as always, we appreciate you joining us as we critically look at both sides of the bars. If you want to know how to reduce crime in America, in New York City, you do it one person at a time, creating an environment that celebrates the human spirit. Recidivism is a result of societal failure to do that, and fortune has demonstrated that lives can change. I tell people all the time, this is where I grew up. This is where I learned what being a man is and what being a productive citizen means. It is the work of this great organization that has helped to shape my ideas, drive my conviction, and further deepen my commitment to the cause. For more than half a century, you have amplified the voices of those who are impacted by unfair policies and helped thousands of justice-involved people transform their lives. You have led by example to show how we can help formerly incarcerated individuals come home, rebuild their lives, and contribute to our communities. It's never about the contract or the milestones first. It's always about the individual. These individuals were literally suffering in incarceration because they just didn't have an address to go to. And for them to walk into a place where it's about them and only them and what they need and only what they need. There's one person in particular, he came through our programs and he ended up opening his own construction company and he came back to Fortune and said, you know, I wanna hire people from here. You know, and it was like about how if you lift one person up, they lift others. Even if it's just one person that this happens to, it's worth it. And I know that it's not just one person, it's many people.